Well, we welcome and we greet each one today in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, and we thank you for choosing to worship with us here at Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church. We trust that you will be blessed and that you will be built up in the most holy faith. And now as we sing together, uh, we ask that you join us as we sing Set My Soul Afire, hymn number 377 in our hymnal. Shall we all stand together as we sing? Thank you. 
this is goodbye to sin and things that can fail. And all of this world can turn me around. If you're saved this morning, you're heaven bound. You're helped in the power of God. Eternity is yours. Hey. In the presence of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. You're free. The word of God says he that's the son makes free is what? Free, free indeed. indeed. Amen. He came to give us life and life more. What? Abundantly. Let's Amen. sing that last verse like we, we are excited about being free from sin. Free from Amen. things that confound us. We're headed to heaven. Nothing can stop us. Praise the Lord, we're going through. Sing that Amen. verse one more time. Goodbye to sin and yes, things and that confound. All of this world shall turn me around. Daily yes. I'm working, I'm praying to and glory to God. We're going through. Yes, he set us free. Yes, he set us free. He said, Yes. He broke the bond of prison for Hallelujah. me. I'm glory bound by Jesus yes, to see for glory to God. He set us free. Hallelujah. Give him praise and glory in his house. And I'm proud of the kids. I'm proud of all of our families. Come on up, young man. Sister. Stand right there, young lady. Matthew and Emily go to school at Westover Christian Academy. And may I say I'm thankful that Nelson and Teresa send them there. It's a valuable place to get a great Christian based education. Let me just read the accomplishments of these two young folks, makes me proud. Matthew, A honor roll in history and spelling, B honor roll in Bible, English, reading and science, top five out of 35 in reading with over, listen to this number, 909,000 words read with 94% accuracy. Isn't that wonderful? And perfect attendance, perfect attendance, didn't miss the first day has an award in perfect attendance, and then another award for history and spelling. Matthew, we're very proud of your accomplishments and your studies. You. Folks, we could be seeing the next Billy Graham standing on the stage right here. I mean, who knows? Great pastor, missionary, preacher. And then for Miss Emily, with that beautiful smile that she always has for her pastor. A honor roll, Bible, math, spelling, English, phonics. Completed all reading requirements for the year. An enthusiastic award. Only missed one day of school. Isn't that wonderful? What an accomplishment. We could be seeing a young missionary lady, a pastor's wife. Who knows what these two children can accomplish. But I want to tell them, just like I told my son all the time, Sandy and I told Mike, it doesn't matter what life you go into, what realm of work you go into for the rest of your life. What matters is that you're a Christian 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of your life, every day serving Christ as your Savior. I want to, let me get one thing. Every now and then in the life of every pastor, There comes the question, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Are what you're doing worth time and effort? Well, I've had one of those months, maybe six weeks, of asking those questions. You see, we, we as a church, I as your pastor, we as a church are doing everything we know to reach people. And I've searched the word of God just to find out if we're missing anything that we're not doing that we should be doing as a church. And is our labor's worth what we're doing? Emily, come here. This morning, Teresa handed me this, and I hesitated to read it. I'm not sure I can get through it. 
But this is the words of this beautiful young lady. It says, I love my pastor. My pastor's name is Pastor Stanley. In most places I see my pastor is at church, and sometimes at the grocery store, but mostly at church. He teaches the Bible to many people, and I like to help him by praying for him. Thank you, Pastor, for teaching me the Holy Word, the Holy Bible. Thank you, sweetheart. You made my day. You made my day. Both of these children make my day. Is it worth it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's worth it. It's really, really worth it. I want to give you your own New Testament, both of you. Thank you for being so faithful to the church, for loving your pastor and loving this church. Give them a round of applause. Oh, my. 
on redemption this morning our redemption draweth nigh look with me in verse 25 of Luke 21 and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity and the sea and her waves roaring men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall ye see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. And when all these things are begun to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, nobody can touch our hearts like you. Nobody can fill us with joy like you. Nobody can fill us with revival fire, with excitement, with expectation, with anticipation like you. Lord, you know that my cup runneth over this morning. Thank you for touching our hearts, touching our service already. Thank you for Holy Spirit's witness. Now, Father, as we look into the Word of God, as we seek to be a blessing to your people, as we seek to be an encouragement to the church, and then, Lord, as we seek to reach those who are not ready for the coming events upon this world because they don't have you as their Savior, help us to reach them. Father, fill us with your power, with your spirit, that we might preach this message that you've laid on our hearts. And may it be for your glory and for your honor in Christ's name. Amen. And when you see these things begin to come to pass, then lift up your heads, or then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Our world is in a mess. The church is not. Our world is in trouble. Christians are not. We're going to preach about redemption this morning. I hope that when we leave here this evening, or this morning, could be this evening, that our heads will be lifted to heaven, our hearts will be full, our tongues will be waiting with expectation to tell somebody that we're leaving this world to tell somebody how they can go with us. When I thought about redemption, when I thought about the word redeemed or redemption, in the word of God, there is well over 200 phrases or words that will talks about redemption of many natures. But my mind goes back to childhood. Many of us, many of you my age, will remember shopping at grocery stores that had this great big sign out front, painted green, and it says, We give S&H green stamps. Well, you could go to your grocery store, and in our case, 
the grocery store came to us, the grocery store delivered to us because we had no mode of transportation. And they'd give you green stamps based on the amount of dollars that you paid for groceries. Now my mama loved green stamps. She had a savings book. And when that groceries was delivered and paid for and they would tear out green stamps and the store that I first store I worked in, we had green stamps. She'd tear those green stamps out and it was valuable to her just as money. You didn't mess with mama's green stamps. They wasn't something to play with. She'd put them in that savings book and then she'd get a catalog. The grocery store would give her a catalog. And in that catalog had lots and lots of items in which she could choose from, pots and pans and sheets and pillowcases and just all sorts of things that you'd need around the house. And it had some toys in it too. Unfortunately, my mama never thought we needed toys. But mama would get those green stamps and she'd save them up and mama would always buy things that with those green stamps that otherwise she'd never buy because she didn't have the money to. And once she ordered those green stamps and she sent out that little form and the grocery store would send it to SNH Green Stamp Place and Mama would be with great excitement. Oh, she's placed her order. And it would be almost like Christmas time when that grocery delivery boy would bring that special package. Nobody got that package. Nobody touched that package but Mama's. That was hers. And great excitement filled her heart because she had redeemed, purchased something that was valuable to her. Bless her heart, my mom never went to many places in her life. Never went many places. But I can remember, and this memory came to me, I shed a few tears about this this week. One day one of our friends, or one of their friends, was going to go to Salem, and in Salem was the SNH Green Stamp Redemption Center. So Miss Clark asked Mom if she would go with them. I never will forget that Saturday that they drove up to Salem. Mom got up that morning, you'd think she's going to church. She put on her best go to meet and dress, her best shoes. She fixed her hair, and she, she gets in that car. She's excited when Mr. and Miss Clark pulled into the driveway. She was excited and she got to go to Salem to the Redemption Center. Well, she was with such, going with such great anticipation and such great expectation and excitement. We didn't leave the house too far that Saturday because we knew Mama was coming home with something special. And when she got home that day, went to the kitchen and pulled out on the table one of the prettiest sets of pots and pans you'd ever want to see. But then to hear Mama talk about the Redemption Center, all the beautiful things that was there, the quilts, the pillowcases, the sheets, the forks and knives and spoons and the pots and pans and the dishes and the plates. Now you would think that was the most precious place in the world. That was probably one of the most highlighted times of my mama's life. Redemption. But nothing as exciting as that was. Nothing can compare to the redemption that we're going to talk about today. The Word of God says, When these things begin to come to pass, then, lift, then look up and lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. What is redemption? What is redemption? Redemption is the purchasing, buying, redeeming of something of value that is in the possession of another by paying a price to redeem it. What a, what a definition. It goes on, the subject of value, even though it has value within itself, is not able to purchase or to redeem its own self. In redemption, the item that's being redeemed, even though it's of great value, has no way of redeeming itself. When the redemption is made the subject of the redeemer, 
I love this. When the when redemption is made the subject of the redeemer, that thing of value, that subject of value, when it's redeemed, it now belongs and resides not in its former place, but it belongs and resides in the possession of the redeemer who purchased it, who paid for it. In the Old Testament, there are many types of redemption. Over 150 times in the Old Testament you find redemption. There's the redemption of land that is being held for debt. When you would put your land up, mortgage your land to pay a debt. When you paid that debt off, that last payment, you redeemed your land back for yourself. There's a redemption of a child who was sent out in servitude. You couldn't pay your bills, so the people, they would take your children in servitude to be a servant in the house of another. And when you were able to go buy that child back, they'd come back to your house, and it was a time of rejoicing. And then it talks about a slave being bought into freedom or redeemed into freedom. When someone would just simply go to the slave market, When they would just simply go to the slave market and with mercy and grace find a slave and purchase it and then say, you're free. Well, what redemption? But the greatest of all redemptions that we could talk about is redemption of a soul. The redemption of the soul of man, the creation made in God's own image, in the image of Christ where we created. You say redemption, you told us what redemption is, but redemption, the need of redemption. What is the need of redemption? Well, we need redeeming brothers and sisters in the world because we are in the possession of another. I needed redemption because I was in the possession of another. You needed redemption because you were being led around in the possession of another. His name was Satan due to the fall of Adam, our forefather. Listen at this in verse 2 of Ephesians 2. Wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in, dis in the children of disobedience. You see, I remember the time in my life that I wasn't following Jesus. I remember a time in my life that I was following the world, the things of the world, and the one who led the world, Satan himself. And in me was the spirit of disobedience. In you was the spirit of disobedience. And we needed redemption. But I want to tell you this. I had no way of redeeming myself. I was so wrapped up in sin and so wrapped up in iniquities and so wrapped up in the things of this world that I didn't know how. If I could, I wouldn't have been able to begin with. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, it says that we were sometimes darkness. Listen to this. This is the reason we needed redemption because we were not in darkness, but we were darkness. I want to tell you, when sin covers your life, when sin hides, binds your eyes from the things of Christ, you're darkness. Not only are you in sin, but in darkness, but darkness covers your life. But it says, praise be unto God because we have been redeemed. Paul writes to the Ephesians and says this, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, it says this, that you who have been delivered from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You say, why do we need redemption? Because we were sinners. Why did we need redemption? Because we were in the possession of satanic power and we were under demonic control. Let me just say this. Why do people sin? Because they're sinners. Why do they take drugs and why do they do alcohol and why do they do all the things in this world? Because they led around in the possession of demonic powers under the influence of none other than Satan. All sinners need redemption. My friend, let me say this. All sinners are going to hell. All sinners are without hope. All sinners have no good in them. All sinners have sinned. And by the way, just in case you think you're not one of them, the word of God says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We needed redemption because the word of God says that the wages of sin is death. And we were headed for death 
not only death physically, but death eternally. So we know that redemption is the buying of a precious, the redeeming, the purchasing of a precious, valuable object, such as the soul of man. We need that sinners need to be redeemed because they're in the possession of Satan. But what did you and I need to be redeemed from? We need to be redeemed from Satan, but we need to be redeemed from sin. Listen to this. Paul writes to the Hebrews in 9.15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by the means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might, be, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. You see, you and I were led around by satanic control under the power of demons, and you and I were filled with sin and iniquity, and we were under the transgressions of the First Testament or the Old Testament, the law. And we were sinners by nature, and we were sinners by habit, and we were sinners by choice. Psalmist writes concerning redemption in 130 verse 8, And he shall redeem Israel from all iniquities. Now let me say this. We need to be redeemed from all iniquities. You say, preacher, you don't understand how many iniquities I have. You don't understand my Redeemer. You say, preacher, I don't, you don't understand how deep in sin I've gone. You don't understand my Savior. You say, preacher, I've done this and I've done that and surely God would never smile on me. You've never understood the face of my God. You say, but preacher, I've been so low in sin and I've been so low in the milk and mire of sin and I'm down and wasted out and I am nothing. You don't know the length of the arm of the love of God. You see, when God saves a sinner, when God redeems a sinner, he redeems us from A-L-L, -L, all iniquities. You see, we're all sinners. The word of God says so. For there is none good, no, not one. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Every one of us are sinners by nature of our father Adam. And then we are sinners by choice because we love to follow the things of this world. And we needed to be redeemed from sin. But not only did we need to be from, de redeemed from sin, but we needed to be from, redeemed from the law of the Old Testament. We find in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 5, to redeem them, or Christ died to redeem them that were under the law, that they might, redeem the, that they might receive the adoption of sons. He says in, in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, and to be made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree. You see, the, the old law, the old covenant that God made with Abraham, the one that he made with Moses, and the covenants enlisted in the Old Testament, the laws in the Old Testament, the, the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament and the, and the laws that proceed from them says this, that unless you keep every, every commandment and keep it in its, con, in, in its completion, and unless, unless redemption is made for you at least once a year by the shedding of blood of an innocent lamb or goat, then you will not ever go to heaven. That's what the law said. But Christ, my, my, my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to this world, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but he came to redeem us out from under that law. You see, there's not one of us ever has been or ever will be that can keep every jot or tittle of the word of God. None of us can keep every one of the laws. So we are guilty and we are cursed with an eternity away from God, away from his presence in hell and in the lake of fire. But I'm gonna tell you this morning that when we were redeemed, not only were we redeemed from sin, and from the bondage of sin and the guilt of sin and the wages of sin, but we were redeemed out of the law which you and I could not keep and was redeemed from the curse which meant that we should die for it because one died in our stead. Praise the Lord. Give him praise and glory. Amen. So we see that we've been redeemed. We've been purchased because of a value, of a, we are valuable to God. We'll get into more than that in a minute. But redemption, how are we redeemed? By whom are we redeemed? By the Lord Jesus Christ and none other. None other power is powerful enough to redeem people from sin and from satanic control. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 3.23, being justified freely through his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. First of all, we're redeemed at no cost to us. No cost to us. You say, why at no cost to you? Because none of us is valuable enough and rich enough and have enough to get to heaven. But not only was it not, it was free to us, but it cost heaven its best. 
It cost the Son of the Lord Jesus, the, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, His life. It says that by the freely by His grace, we have redemption in Christ Jesus and through His blood. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 44, 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and besides me there is no other God. Who redeemed me? The Creator. Who redeemed you? The one and the only God. Listen at who our Redeemer is. Isaiah looks to God and he says, Lord, you've redeemed me, but how? By the Redeemer, our Lord of hosts, by Jesus Christ our Lord, who is the first and the last, and besides me there is no other God. I don't understand what I just read. Let me tell you why I don't understand why I just read. I don't understand how a God who created everything, as we'll look at in a minute, as Isaiah says in verse 24 or 44, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer that hath formed thee in, the, in thy womb, formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord which maketh all things and stretches forth the heavens alone and the breath abroad on the earth by itself. I don't understand how God in his holiness and in his greatness and in his majesty and his glory, when he created us in the image of God, in the likeness of Christ created he, him, male and female created he, them. And we turned our back on him. And we chose to go our own way and follow the leadership of Satan. Being hooked in the nose by demonic power. Being filled with iniquities and sin. Being accursed by the law. I don't understand his love. He didn't ask me to understand it. He just asked me to accept it. Amen. How the one that stood out on nothing and spoke into existence all that we have who formed us in the belly of our mother, in the womb of our mother. As he told Jeremiah, I knew thee before you was ever born, and I formed you in the, in your, in the womb of your mother. How when the one who formed us, and yet we turned our backs on him, the one who made all things, besides him was nothing made, that it was made, it made Christ made it all, and stretched that forth the heavens alone, and, by this, and spreadeth out abroad the earth by itself, the one who spoke into existence, and took his finger, and run the rivers and the creeks, hung the stars and the moons and the planets, and all the universe around us, and formed the mountains and the valleys, and created us, and looked upon us, in our filth, in our iniquities, in our sins, in our ignorance, in our intolerance, in our hatred towards Him, and says, I love Him. I love Him so much that I'll go to an old rugged cross. Or I, first of all, I'll, I love Him so much that I'll take on them the form of humans. And I'll go down and I'll walk amongst them. And I'll live with them. And I'll suffer the pain and agony and anguish that they suffer. And then I'll teach them about me. And I'll teach them about my father. And I'll teach them that this is not everything. That one of these days there's a place that they can come to and abide with me forever. But yet there's a place that they can go to that they'll be out of my presence forever. And that I'm going to love them so much when I walk amongst them. And I'm going to love them so much and I'm going to teach them so much. And I'm going to leave word for all that follows them. And I'm going to go to an old rugged cross. I'm going to willingly of myself lay myself down on that cross. After having taken their beating and their bruising and their stripes and their crown of thorns. And the plucking of the beard from my face and being beat by the cat of nine tails. I'm going to pick up an old piece of wood and I'm going, to lead it. I'm going to carry it just as far as I can up to Calvary's mountain and they're going to take me and lay me down on that cross or I'm going to lay myself down and they're going to put nails through my hands and my feet and they're going to hang me between heaven and earth and I'm going to say I'm dying for you because I love you. Boy, don't tell me you understand that love. Don't tell me you can understand it. I, I don't believe there's a human mind that can grasp it. But there are human hearts that can receive it. Then he says, I'm going to die. I'm going to say it's finished. The work of salvation is finished. I have given the price for their redemption. And they're going to take my body and they're going to lay it in a tomb, but I'm not going to stay there because I'm going to go into the heart of the earth and I'm going to redeem those Old Testament saints who have been looking forward to my, to my coming and I'm going to take them to be with us in eternity in the presence of my Father forever, but I'm going to march into the, into the gates of hell 
because my church is going to march through the gates of hell. Hell cannot prevail against the church of God. And I'm going to walk up to old Satan who God my father kicked out of heaven and I'm going to get from him off of his belt the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And on that third day I'm going to rise victorious because the church is going to live a victorious life because I gave myself to it and I'm going to ascend into my father. But one of these days when the days of ascension is over and the days of grace is over, I'm going to go back and get the ones that I love and bring them to myself. Well, glory. Who's my redeemer? Isaiah says in 44, 4, As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Jeremiah says, The Redeemer is strong, the Lord of hosts is his name. You see, our Redeemer, the one who loved us, the one who died for us, is none other than Jesus Christ. No one more powerful. No one more greater. And we know according to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there is no other name under, under, given among men whereby men must be saved. There is no other authority to redeem him. Give the Redeemer praise and glory. Now this message, God gave me this message a few weeks ago, but Monday morning, or in the wee hours of Monday morning, I was sort of thinking all night about this message. The question came to me. I was a Value to God, so he redeemed me. He purchased me out of somebody else's possession, satanic control. My redeemer is Christ Jesus. He re redeemed me from sin, the iniquities of sin, the guilt of sin, the wages of sin. But why? Why was I redeemed? Why were you redeemed? Let me just give you something to praise God for. The psalmist said in 49.8, For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever. Well, Christ redeemed us because to us, to him, we are precious. Our soul is precious. We have something of great value. Do you remember the definition of redemption? Is the purchasing of something of value? We are of value to God. Don't ever let the devil sit on your shoulder and whisper in your ear that you're no good and you're no value. Tell him to go home. You know what I'm saying? Tell him to go home because the redemption of people are precious to God. We find in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 23, listen to what God says. Whom God went to redeem for a people to himself and to make for him a name and to do unto you great things and terrible in thy land before thy people. You see, we were created by God for fellowship to begin with. We chose not to fellowship with, with God, but God missed us. Did you get what I just said? God missed us. He missed our fellowship. And we were precious because we were created in his likeness. So he sent the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, to redeem us. Why? To himself. He wanted a people for himself that he could make a name amongst us for himself. That he could do great and wonderful things in the land before his people or for his people. God redeemed us to himself that he could bless us, in other words. God redeemed us to himself that he could be good to us. That he could do great and wonderful things in our lives. I want to tell you this morning, everything that you have done, everything that you have, everything that you are, everything that you ever hoped to have and ever hoped to be is because God loved us so much that he redeemed us out of iniquity of sin and brought us to himself. Paul writes to Titus and says this in 2.14, that Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. How much? All iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Why was we redeemed? Because he wanted us. Because he valued us. Because he wanted our friendship and our fellowship. And he wanted us to love us and for us to love him. Isaiah says this in 62.12, and they, called, and they shall call uh, them a holy people, a redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called a, a salt out, a city not forsaken. Why did he redeem us? For himself, that we might be a holy 
people, that we might be a peculiar people, that we might be his people, that we might be in his works, that we might be ordained to do good works for him, and that we might be a people called the church, the called out ones, a city not forsaken. I'm so glad this morning when everything else around us forsakes us, all the people around us forsake us, God never forsakes us, he never forsakes his church, and his church never forsakes him. Oh, listen, Christ is our Redeemer. He redeemed us because he wanted us and because he loved us, because he cared for us, because he wanted our fellowship. But how was we redeemed? We know who redeemed us, but how was we redeemed? Peter writes to us in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For as much as you know you were not redeemed of corruptible things as silver and gold from the vain conversations or traditions which received by tradition of your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. How was I redeemed from sin? How was I purchased from Satan? By the blood of Jesus Christ. By every drop of his blood. By every drop of his blood. By him willingly giving his blood to wash away my sins. Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12, Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood hath he entered in once into the holy place, having retained eternal redemption for us. You say, preacher, how long are we redeemed for? Forever. Eternal redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ. If he's your redeemer and you've been redeemed from sin and you've been redeemed by his blood, give him praise and glory in his house. We've been redeemed. But that's not an act of the past. You say, preacher, redemption's not an act of the past. No, the day you was redeemed, it was present. The redemption we have in him is still present. So the two terms or the two t t tenses of redemption is present and future. Listen to this. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In whom we have present tense redemption. We're sitting right here this morning. We have redemption. We used to be in the, in, 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 the, in the possession of Satan. We used to be in the possession of demonic control. But we're sitting in his house this morning in the redemption of Christ Jesus. In other words, we have redemption every day of our life in Jesus Christ. Not only are we redeemed daily by him and we have redemption through his blood which is present with us. But we have the forgiveness of sins. How many sins according to the riches of his grace? You say, preacher, here again, you don't know my sins. You don't know the riches of the, of the grace of my Savior. Preacher, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the bank account of my Father. You say, preacher, you don't understand. You don't know the value of the blood of our Redeemer. We are redeemed presently. We're forgiven presently. Not only that, that Isaiah writes to us in, four, in chapter 44 and verse 22, the words of God I have blotted out as a thick crowd, cloud thy, possession, thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins return unto me for I have redeemed thee. We have redemption today. He, he redeemed us on the cross of Calvary. We receive his redemption today. We have, I have blotted out. When does he blot out our sins? At Calvary. And every time we sin. You say, but preacher, don't you believe in sinless perfection? No, I don't believe in sinless perfection. Why? Because I still walk around in a body. I still walk around in this sinful world. One of these days I'll never sin again. You said, no. Yeah, when I get to heaven, neither will you. But we have forgiveness of sins because we have current redemption. And every time we sin, we say, Father, I'm sorry. I confess, I'm a sinner, I confess. And the word of God says it is blotted out. It is blotted out as a cloud. It's no more there. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who God has made unto, wisdom, made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. But of him are ye now in Christ Jesus. Now, right now. Aren't you glad that you don't have to wait to get to heaven to have salvation? And what has God took us? Listen, you heard the description of what we were and who we belonged to. But let's look at the description that we have now because we have redemption. We have been made unto us wisdom. 
Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We who were dumb is now wise. We who were unrighteous is now, un now righteous. We who were sinful is now sanctified and set apart for the master's use and have redemption in Christ Jesus. Amen. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We are redeemed now. Coloss in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, now, even the forgiveness of sins. But you say, preacher, how about tomorrow? How about the next day? How about 10 years from now? How about 100 years from now? Let's look at redemption in the future. Ro Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which are the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to witness the redemption of the body. I don't know about you, but ever since the day I got saved, and every day afterwards, especially today, I'm looking forward to the day that I leave this world. I'm looking for the day that Jesus comes and redeems me out of this body of sin and hurt and pain and agony and disappointment and discontentment and takes me home to be with him forever, the redemption of the body. Whether by death or by rapture, it makes no difference to me. The psalmist writes concerning our future redemption in 111.9. He sent redemption unto his people and he has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. Our redemption is eternal in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.14, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You see, Christ Jesus. Whew. Christ Jesus went to where I was in all that I was, in the condition that I was. Paid the price or the cause of my redemption, brought it to himself. And ever since we came to know Christ, I'm, if, this is not if this is not true in your life, you best be checking up on your salvation. Ever since we came to know Christ, we've been anxious to leave this world. Oh, we've been wanting to go to heaven. Oh, there's a part of us, this human part, this fleshly part that wants to remain here as long as we can. That's understandable. But deep down inside of us, there's a longing to see our Redeemer. There's a longing to see the one who loved us and gave himself for us. We're going to leave this world. But my God will redeem my soul from the power of death, the power of the grave, and he shall receive, receive me, Selah, Psalmist writes. Let me read that as we really read it today. But God will redeem my soul from death, from the power of death. We find Hosea says this, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. And then we find Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, chapter uh, 15, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? One of these days, whether we leave this world by death, we'll not stay dead. But when the moment that I'll die, I'll be more alive than ever because of the power of God that takes us to heaven. And then we'll have eternal redemption in a place of peace. Isaiah writes and describes it in, in verse 30, chapter 35 and verse 9. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall be upon them, and they shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there forever. There's coming a place, there's coming a time that we leave this world. Going to a place that's been prepared for us by Jesus Christ himself, there we have redemption forever. Give him praise and glory. Amen. We've talked about redemption, being, being purchased as a thing of value to God, being precious in his sight, being loved by him so much that he redeemed us from where we were and made us part of himself. By the, by the shedding of his blood, he took us out of sin and made us into the family of God, adopted us out of the family of this world into the family of God. Now, you might ask one question. Redemption, who can have it? Who can be redeemed? Who can be redeemed? I'm glad to tell you this, that there's no limit on God's redemption. The psalmist writes to us and says this, that all, will, all that will come to Christ can have redemption. In Psalms, in Psalms 130, verse 7, let hope in the Lord, for the Lord is there, for with the Lord there is mercy, and in him his plenteous redemption. I want to tell you he will redeem us to the ends of the earth. 
It's not, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He'll reach out to the uttermost, or may I say to the guttermost. He'll reach out to the, to the down and the out and the out and the down. He'll reach out to that deepest in sin or the one who thinks they have no sin, but all have sinned and all are sinners. And so he comes to everybody. Everybody can come to him and have redemption in Christ Jesus. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he has loved us. Christ died for who? For all, regardless of creed, regardless of color, regardless of nationality, regardless of education, regardless of wealth, regardless of whatever you, those regardlesses might be, everybody can have redemption in Christ Jesus. So all can be redeemed. You say, preacher, what's the result of redemption? What's the result of redemption? Let me just share a few things with you, just the result of it. The redeemed will live like the Redeemer. Oh, wow. The redeemed will live like the Redeemer. The psalmist writes to us in Psalms 26 and verse 11, But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful forever. He says, I will walk in the integrity of my Redeemer. You know what our job is? Is to look like Jesus and act like Jesus and walk like Jesus and talk like Jesus. Those Berean Christians over in the book of Acts, when they, when they were... The, the early church was just growing by leaps and bounds. And they were upsetting religion, and they was upsetting Satan, and they was upsetting the world, and they had turned their city upside down for God. And they'd walk down the street with their heads hung, held high, and they would be singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. They might have been singing all the precious old Testament Psalms, I have no idea, but they were being a witness for Jesus. And somebody would look at them and say, there goes those old Christians. There goes those old Christians. Would to God that we'd have the day that people would point their fingers at us and say, there goes Christians. There goes Christians. We need to live and walk like, the, like Christ so much that the world itself would not want to be a part of us, that the world itself would, would look at us and point their finger at us and say, there goes those little Christians. There goes those little Jesuses. There goes those little Christ. That's what Christian means. And would to God we would live that and every church would manifest that, that, that definition and that, that attitude and that conduct. But we will walk in integrity. We will praise the Redeemer. The redeemed will praise the Redeemer. The psalmist says in 71, 23, My lips shall greatly rejoice, and I will sing unto thee, and my soul which thou hast redeemed. Oh, we won't be busy singing his praises. We won't be busy telling somebody about him. We want to be re re busy rejoicing and giving him praise and glory. Psalms 107 and verse 2 says this, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I want to tell you this morning, church, we ought to be excited. We ought to, be, we ought to have great excitement. We ought to have revival fires move, moving and burning in our heart. We ought to be courageous and we ought to be bold and we ought to be moving for God and saying this, I'm saved by by the grace of God, I who was in the clutches of the devil, I who was filled with sin and iniquity, I who was headed for hell, have been redeemed, have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not what I used to be. I don't go where I used to go. I don't do the things I used to do. Jesus Christ lives in me. The life that I now live is because he lives and is alive in me. And we ought to hold our heads high when people look at us and say, there goes those Christians.